And this video is going to be more of a ramble of sorts, a good old-fashioned rant, if you will. Although not so much a rant, but rather an exposition on a series of observations I've been making in the back of my mind, alongside some of the popular science fiction I grew up with as a kid. I've been more conscientious about my health as of late, in part because, despite my ongoing success and health with my kidney transplant, I've been paying more attention to the foods I eat, I've been trying to do takeout less, and I've been trying to cook more at home, especially for us Orthodox Christians that the Nativity Fast is just around the corner, and I would like to have some variety this winter in terms of the food that I usually eat right before Christmas. However, I've also been thinking about sort of these large-scale macro and macroeconomic trends that often get discussed on this side of politics. The most important one, of course, that I think everyone has been discussing has been the issue of fertility and how to boost native birth rates. After all, it seems that even the most neoliberal and progressive political commentators acknowledge that there's going to be an issue when it comes to the population. We're no longer dealing with the sort of deep, hidden cabals of the Club of Rome telling us that overpopulation will be a problem from the 1970s onward, but rather instead you have books like that of Empty Planet, written in 2019, that discusses actually one of the biggest issues that will be coming forth in this century and the next, is going to be a plateauing and then steadily declining human population, not just in the West, but all over the world. Even the more laudable, or I guess laughable in some senses, Peter Zihan, who wrote a book, The End of the World is Only Just Beginning, had discussed this very trend, although to him he thinks that the Western world will just be fine, and it will carry on the way it has been, and we can enjoy our mix of interesting fusion cuisines as long as we maintain immigration and healthy supply chains, along with some industrialization back at home. While, of course, many on this side of things know that that is not going to be a process that can last indefinitely. After all, no empire lasts forever. It also reflects, I think, quite well the ongoing project that so many people have been thinking about and focusing on. A lot of individuals on the internet that I associate with, you would find them to be a relatively online phenomenon. Oh, what does RWBB mean? Well, it means right-wing bodybuilder. You've got people like Raw Egg Nationalist, Peters, Ice Cream Nationalism, and so on. All these sort of gimmicky titles and names in order to set a brand for themselves. But their health mission, I think, is rather important. After all, all that we have to do on this earth is to take care of ourselves. We have biological impulses that we must maintain. We have to be able to respond to the fact that we're hungry, we're thirsty, and how do we take care of ourselves in an age where it seems like everything around us is unhealthy. Oftentimes, I am reminded of when I buy products from California or I manage to go to Home Depot and pick up some lumber, and it'll say, warning, this product is known, according to the officials of the state of California, to cause cancer as I'm picking up a bunch of two-by-fours and taking them back to my car. I have to chuckle sometimes. I often say that it's not everything causes cancer. It's just that California causes cancer. But of course, cancer rates are higher than ever. People are addicted to drugs more than ever. And we have hundreds of thousands of people in the United States alone dying each year, either due to prescription drugs or illegal drugs when it comes to opioids and fentanyl in the United States. This all coincides with a myriad of things I've been seeing online, all these sort of techno-optimistic views. And I don't mean in the sort of like Mark Andresine sense of techno-optimism, I mean the I heckin' love science kind of optimism. The type of people that will show you a video of a proof of concept that we can make ice cream out of recycled plastics, although more and more studies each year indicate that our consumption of plastics has been found in everything from deep lung tissue to that of children still in their mother's womb, even in the earliest days after conception. This, of course, coincides with falling testosterone rates in the United States and most of the Western world. It coincides with the rise of autogynephilia, pornographic addiction here in the United States, as well as the rest of the Western world. And I can't help but think to myself that we are on the precipice, if not currently undergoing, a great genetic bottleneck. 
for those unfamiliar, a bottleneck scenario in evolution or in genetics and population studies is, well, kind of what you saw in the thumbnail to this video. A catastrophic event occurs where the gene pool is significantly reduced, the population is brought almost to near extinction levels, and you're left with two options. You either manage to survive the cataclysm, and you can reproduce, and your genes carry on, and the species survives, or you never survive above replacement rates again, and slowly but surely your genetic material and your species dies out. Not just in terms of humanity writ large, but also the Western ideal in the United States, as well as in Europe, are going through these bottlenecks. Whether it be due to selection pressures by our own governments when it comes to immigration, and no one seems to be promoting healthy fertility outside of places like Poland or Hungary, Although I am hopeful here in the United States for the Natalist Conference that has been started up by the Exit Group and has gotten a lot of support from other people. And it does illustrate what kind of cataclysm that we're really in. That the idea that a bunch of people want to have healthy testosterone levels in their body, want to make sure that we're not eating things that are hyper-processed and full of plastic, that we don't have more people coming in that we can't support, supporting industrial farming that eliminates our capability to have long-term agricultural success in the country, all while these pressures limit the ability for people to have children. There's, of course, the willpower question as well, which I think is another huge cataclysmic event that adds on top of our ongoing struggles in this genetic bottleneck. I often think about the Black Death, the bubonic plague, and how if you look at the history of Europe during that time, people were still born, people still went to church, people still got married, people still sued each other and went to war, and yet in the midst of all of that, People still had children. People were still doing what was natural to them. A more recent example comes from my friend Conscious Caracol, that even in the camps that the British government had during the Boer War in South Africa, people still had children in those camps as well. There was that desire to you know, mate, there was a desire to carry on the line and lineage and have children with their spouses and those that they were in love with and to make do. And of course, there's the more barbaristic or unnatural consequence of things when it comes to civilization. But still, even then, children were born in the worst of times. And now, in an age where all forms of politics, media, the economy is particularly cited against one group of individuals, predominantly white Europeans, both in the U.S. and in the West writ large, competing against jobs for immigrants that will take way less money when it comes to getting paid, the exacerbating housing crisis for single-family homes for them to establish a nuclear family, not to mention, of course, the ongoing great sort of checking out where the market, by various selection pressures in the wake of progressive movements, both from governments and academia, has decided that they're not going to really hire white people anymore, but rather minorities and people of color. It does illustrate to me, at least, that we are in a selection pressure bottleneck sort of scenario that is, from the top down, forced upon you, you're going to have to make do and survive. And if you don't want to like fight for it, well, don't worry. There's all sorts of pornography, there's all sorts of drugs, and if you really want to take yourself out of the gene pool, well, do not worry. We have state-sponsored, taxpayer-funded ways for you to castrate yourself and to live out this fantasy that somehow you too can be a woman or a man of your choosing, and that we can carve ourselves out of anything but instead of the marble statue that you'll be carving, instead it will be something out of I have no mouth and I must scream. Except now you can't mate, and all that you can do now is impotently, very literally impotently, rage against the world that you thought was somehow catered to your own predilections and tastes. I say all these things because I was recently reminded through seeing an old rerun on television I don't really get, I don't have cable, so it was interesting to see an old episode of Star Trek The Next Generation play in the background. And as convoluted as the story and canon of the Star Trek universe goes, 
One of the things that was playing in the background of our current years, the 2020s, the early 2000s, was something known as the eugenics wars, which was part of World War III. People creating super soldiers, genetic supermen, the very kind of Nazi-esque ideals that I think were very terrifying to the Roddenberries of the world that somehow we could make better men. And that people like, you know, Khan were so terrifying because they were smarter, they were better, they were more tactical. And that's why eugenics were banned. Which, of course, always leaves the awkward, well, what do you do with genetic diseases and disorders? You either let them exist, or as we saw in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, if you were to get your conditions fixed for your mentally retarded child, well, you're going to be arrested by Federation authorities. I say all this because I think that we're in some kind of eugenic-style warfare that's being sponsored by globalization, our Western governments, and a very strong anti-white, anti-Western attitude that exists in almost every facet of our culture. Whether it's saying that, oh, British individuals have no culture, or what is a white American really supposed to do except watch football on Sundays, eat his burgers, drink beer, get fat, and try and avoid saying anything racist or offensive. There's more to us than that, but we have been reduced, or are attempting to be reduced, to nothing more than an atomized collection of populations that can be ruled over with ease. You don't have the testosterone levels to fight back. You are more catty. You're surrounded by a feminizing environment, whether that be at work with these cute little agile meetings surrounded by women all over, or knowing that you have to compete against a job both against women, but also immigrant populations that are after the same thing that you are, which is money and a livelihood and a job. These are the kind of things that I've been thinking about in relation to this whole sort of backdrop of the late 20th century, early 21st century in the Star Trek universe. This war was being waged right before people's very eyes, and they didn't even realize that the things that they were consuming could alter their DNA, or better yet, they just took it because it was easy, and they didn't care, and there was no desire to fight back against consequences that we do not know. The late French philosopher, Paul Virilio had stated in The Original Accident that with every creation of a new technology, we inadvertently create the accident to that technology, whether we like it or not. Well, one of the things that he had said a while back was the concept of the cellular Hiroshima, or the genetic Hiroshima, as I like to call it. And I certainly think that we're in the midst of that. We are in a genetic, economic, and civilizational bottleneck. We are fighting against forces that are both forces of belief, religion, politics, and ideology, but also very real, tangible, physical things that we're fighting against. It's not just ghosts or shadows, whether that be medicine, whether that be pornography, whether that be the simple fact that everything you seem to touch causes some kind of long-term disease or cancer or even access to screens. The earlier we are in life or the more we're behind one, the more likely we are to develop schizophrenia or even just ocular conditions. Everything right here, right now, is telling us that we are in the midst of a great genetic conflict as much as we are civilizational. Again, this goes back to all sort of classic thinking and understanding of a people and a nation or a state or even just an identity as a tribe, that they are real, tangible people right in front of you, your own flesh and blood. Now, of course, this isn't to say that everyone is going to be saved. After all, it's a genetic bottleneck for a reason. People will not get married. People are not going to have children. People are going to find themselves unable to resist the tempting allure of pornography, or the transgender industrial complex, and we're witnessing it right before our very eyes. I'm not one who's really big under the concept of predictive programming, although nowadays with television shows and media, it's not so much predictive as it's just straight-up programming. Shows like FBI and others seem to have nothing but majority minority casts, and every criminal is a white guy, which is why Law & Order SVU is always so entertaining, because it's really not the white people that are committing all these heinous sexual crimes, but that's a story for another day. We are in the midst of a great bottleneck. 
civilizationally, genetically, ideologically. And I think it needs to be said, and I'm sure it has been said long before I've decided to make this video, but this is the kind of cataclysmic event that you're in. From microplastics to falling testosterone levels to the difficulties in competing for a livelihood and a mate, the future generations have a lot of work ahead of them, as well as my own. I am 27 years old, I work out, I garden, I stick to orderly, traditional means of hierarchy and society. Still working on finding a wife, still working on making sure that one day I too will have children. But even I am limited by my own limitations by the nature of my condition and my diseases. Hopefully I get to carry on some of that Western English canon and American history along with me, and hopefully maintain the project I've always set out with myself in politics, that my grandchildren will sit under the vine and fig tree I planted, and they shall sit under it and not be afraid. Whether or not I make it doesn't really matter. But as long as these ideas and these people make it, to me, that's the war that we're fighting. And we're in the bottleneck right now. The question really becomes, do you have the means, and more importantly, the discipline, to make it out on the other side?